G'day guys, I've just had Ryan B on the channel talking about his recent undefeated run with the World Leaders at a Canadian major event. Undefeated six rounds, absolutely fantastic result. Now, he recently did an interview with The Red Path where he broke down each matchup that he played at the event in great detail. So what I thought I would do is follow up on top of that episode and talk about all of the matchups that he didn't play. So we talk about World Leaders into Custodies, how that matchup goes, World Leaders into Necrons, World Leaders into Imperial Guard, into the Death Guard. We talked about Thousand Suns, we talked about Chaos Knights, we talked about all of the different factions from the perspective of somebody who just went undefeated at a major event. So it's a really interesting conversation. We touch on a lot of different tips and tricks that World Leaders players can use in these tricky matchups. So with that being said, let's jump straight into my interview with Ryan B. Blog for the G'day guys, I just wanted to take a second to talk to you about the exciting Blog for the Blood God fundraiser raffle, where you can buy tickets for your chance to win a set of neoprene objective markers and a pack of 50 Blog for the Blood God dice. If you'd like to buy some tickets, click on the link in the description of this video. You can scroll down and view the prizes there. And if you'd like to buy some tickets, select buy tickets, select how many tickets you would like to buy, select that you are over 18 and that you agree with the terms. And then I would recommend deselecting the subscription because who needs unnecessary emails? And then you can proceed to fill out your details. If you are an Australian resident, you will be required to select your state. If not, just select any state. It doesn't particularly matter as long as the street address and details of postage are correct as per above. And then you can go through, proceed on payment, and then it will submit your ticket sales. The reason we've decided to do a raffle in order to raise funds is because this year I have been named as captain for Team Australia for the WTC World Team Championships of Warhammer 40k. This is a once in a lifetime, really exciting opportunity for me. However, as an Australian, that trip is extremely expensive and unfortunately, life does what it does and has thrown a bunch of unforeseen expenses my way in the terms of veterinary bills for my very sick cat. So any help that we can get to send me to Europe to represent Australia would be greatly appreciated. And also, if there's any money left over at the end, it will go towards improving the quality and frequency of the content here on YouTube. So I very much appreciate any support that you are prepared to give, and I look forward to rewarding that with some exciting prizes. If this does well, we'll do multiple of these raffles because I've got plenty of stuff to give away and I really do want to show some support for the community that supports me so well. So thank you very much for your consideration. If you'd like to buy a ticket, links are in the description below and let's get into today's video. Alrighty, Ryan, thank you very much for taking the time out of your morning to join me and my listeners to talk about your recent success with the World Eaters. So welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I appreciate being here. Uh, so I guess the best place to start is to talk a little bit about the event that you recently went undefeated at. I know you've done some interviews and some um, videos over on the Red Path. I'm going to put the show notes mm. to those and the links to those in the description. We'll try not to cover too much of that same ground and we'll talk about some different yep. interesting sort of expanding topics on top of that. But do you want to maybe awesome. just introduce yourself, uh, run us through the event itself a little bit, and then we'll get us stuck into the meat and gravy later. For sure, yeah. Um... So my, I'm Ryan, I guess I've been playing competitive 40k for, my my first big GT was the last Berry Bash, so just over a year now. Um, but yeah, that was a, a really fun event, I've been working hard with my uh, local uh, group, GTA 40k, so I um, lead that team and we're doing a big team event, uh, not this weekend but next, so we're looking really looking forward to that. But yeah, running, uh, ever since the, the new World Leaders Codex dropped, I've been running them. They were my uh, original army that I wanted to play. Um, didn't love the models at the time, but the new line really, really, uh, really uh, obviously spoke to me. And so now, uh, here I am, I have, an, I have five armies, and I haven't picked up anyone else since the book dropped. So. Yeah, uh, it's such a fun faction to play, and I agree that yeah. new range of models are all so good. You know, the, the Lord Invocatus looks amazing, really dynamic yeah. pose. The eight band are a fantastic kit, so I think you chose a really good faction, and I'm not biased at all. <laughs> no, no, no. 
Um, okay. So, like I said, you've done some really interesting videos recently on the on the the event itself. So we won't go over too much detail there because I don't want this to just be a carbon copy. Yeah. I want to sort of expand on it. Um, but just to catch people up, so that if they haven't seen that other yeah. video, um, they know sort of where, what we're jumping off from. Did you want to maybe yeah. run us through uh, what the event that you went to was um, yeah, and for sure. what your list was? Absolutely. So it was the 10th annual Berry Bash. Um, so that's a wonderful uh, tournament put on by um, the renowned Skari. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him here on the channel. He's a big YouTuber uh, for Jukari. Um, he's local, obviously, Canadian scene. So uh, great to have him in, our, in my local area, and he runs a great event. So that was really fun. Um, it was a six-round event, three uh, rounds per day. Um, so we relaxed in terms of most um, six rounds, I guess. Most six rounders, I feel like, are going to the four and two. And so you get that, like, grueling first day. Uh, so this was it was nice to just have to play three games in one day, and then yeah. you get the next three games. Um, a little harder on people have to travel, but, um, yeah, I, I, I personally like that style more. Um, in terms of my list, uh, so I feel like if you're familiar uh, with any of the World Leader Discords, you've probably seen me, or my pop, my name pop up, and uh, you're easily list, the most list. prolific person in that in that chat. I, I, I hover in there. I don't post too often, but I hover in there a fair bit, and I'm always following yeah. your stuff because you do great work in there. But yeah, right, tell us I about the list. Yeah, so um, we uh, we start with Angron, of course. Um, we, uh, yeah, I mean, he asked he. I, he I actually just did a, a tier list with uh, Red Path as well, um, and so he's he's like the best unit we have just for a variety of reasons. Um, but yeah, he's a must-have for cracking any Marines, uh, especially Ironstorm. And then I add in a Avocado or Lord Avocados so that we can do the uh, the great scout stuff. Um, I think Glaive Mo, so the Master Executions for those who don't know the acronym, is. Um, just as almost as important as Angron because of the, some of the stuff that he does that's unique that no one else does. Yeah. So I always run him. Um, and then I have a little bit of a, I guess it's a little bit of a snowflake pick now is my uh, Lord on Juggernaut with Favored. Um, I still run him. I'm still a huge fan. He's not a great unit in and of himself, but I find that even though that the Favored is once per game now, it's massive for our army to get stuck in. Like where yeah. that's where we need to be, right? We need to be in combat getting an extra turn of reliable advance and charge when you really need a go turn to happen and making all your charges you know three to four inches shorter or in some instances obviously with the strat six that's a huge deal like it can't be understated yeah, and he's agree. he's reliable in combat to pick up chaff he's a great backline um bodyguard like he'll go like aspect warriors will go teleport in your back line and you can run them over pretty easily like it's not you're not too worried about it whereas like something else might have trouble picking them up or die before you can do that. I find that he does a really good job in that role. Then you've got um, two times 10 units of jackals. Uh, I'd never leave home without 20 jackals, uh, sticky icons, all the good stuff that they bring. Um, just a really, really, really strong unit and a great toolbox. And then they obviously put out a little bit of damage on stuff like nerglings and stuff like that. So um, a great, great utility piece for them. Um, 10 Berserkers, uh, Necron matchup is, uh, a big deal. There's lots of Necrons are doing really well. They're probably the best perform. They are the best performing army in the meta. And we have exactly one unit that kills Katan in one activation. And that's 10 Berserkers with a character. Um, it yeah. doesn't matter which character. So at least 10 of them to just deal with that. Also do the blood surge. Obviously you stick them with Mo, and then you've got a fight first blood surge combo. It's awesome. Um, and we've got... Uh, a rhino, the party bus to carry the boys, um, and then we've got two times three eight bound. I'm a massive fan of eight bound, like regular eight bound. Um, I think that independent scout, so being able to put them on the flanks, away from avocado, and just kind of like get where you need to go. Also with the reroll wound rolls of one, I get a often I get full wound rerolls too on those hard to kill targets, stuff that like you need two activations to get through. Having full wound rerolls on that second activation feels so good, just because you know you're reliably going to take it down now. Um, and then we've got uh, a three damage champion like that. I think that's a lot of people are sleeping on the three damage champion. Strength ten, AP two, three damage. Maybe with some rerolls from Rangron, probably with some sustained hits. Um, one unit of three eight bound with plus one to wound will kill a war dog, um, and that's very low. Um, 
input for you to deal with a like a, a vehicle like that. So you can just throw out a unit of eight bound, trade out for a war dog, and not have to worry about you know throwing out your exalted or your angron to do to deal with that target. Um, and then we've got three units of exalted. They're my deep strike rapid ingress target if I feel that that's necessary in the mission slash matchup. There's sometimes where I don't. Uh, deep strike them and I'll just start them on the board and try to run you over as fast as I can um, and I'll scout them um, along with a unit of six exalted eight bound uh, so that's the, the last piece of the list um, they're big beefy boys lots of chopping um, I find that they're great for that one activation that you need once again if I face Canoptic Court they'll chew through a wraith block in one activation um, they're you know custodes are so hard to kill but one of the best tools is a six block of exalted eight bound. You force them to either spend the four up feel no pain or minus one damage, and even then you're still killing a, a couple of custodes and then hopefully surviving the clap back with a five up feel no pain is great. Um, that's pretty much the list. You've got your three big hammers and then a bunch of little hammers rolling around and some a couple utility units. Yeah, man, I love the list. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But I like the way that you've got some big units and some small units because that allows you to do things like. You know, if they put out something small, you can trade something small. Yeah. If they put out something big that requires a, a serious response, you have those serious yeah. elements in your list to respond. And you can also do things like use your regular eight bound to bait out the four up feel no pain or the fights first mm -hmm. with those custodies for sure. sort of thing. Yeah. Because they're not going to let that strength 10, three damage guy just start ripping into their custodies. So they're going to have to do something about it. But that means yeah. that they're not likely to have those resources when they deal with the big 100%. six man exalted. So. I think it's a really clever list. I think a lot of those elements, you like you said with Angron, there's a lot of must takes. There's a lot of things that just everybody yep. runs. Uh, but I think you've done some interesting stuff with the way that you've sort of woven those different unit sizes in with each other. Um, yeah, so, it's, a really, it's a really fun list. So, blog for the blood god, exclusive high quality dice. Blog for the blood god, exclusive high quality dice. Blog for the blood god, exclusive high quality dice. Hi, I'm Dean Simbet, President and CEO of Blog for the Blood God's exclusive high quality dice warehouse and emporium. Due to a shipping error, I'm currently overstocked with Blog for the Blood God exclusive high quality dice, and I'm passing the savings on to you! Roll 9 inch charges, pass invulnerable saves, roll high for damage, and score lots of hits. Check out the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today. Uh, for the, um, the event itself, um, so it was the six yep. rounds, I've got you down here as Tyranids, Space Wolves, Admech, Eldari and Sisters, so I must have missed one of your matchups. Jukari in third round three. Oh, Jukari in round three. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, do you want to maybe just give us, like, maybe one highlight from each of those games? And like I said at the start, for those watching, if you want, like, a deep dive on each of these games, go check out the video from The Red Path. I'll put the link in the description. Um, but do you want to maybe just, to catch us up and talk a little bit about yeah, for sure. the, the factions and the matchups, just maybe one highlight from each game? Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. The Tyranid game was really fun. Kelly had an awesome painted army. Um, she was a great opponent. I think one of the it was maybe maybe it's a low light. Um, it's uh, it's she couldn't roll dice to save her life. Uh, there were two instances where an exocrine shot into a six man block of uh, exalted and got z zero forced saves. Oh wow! So no hits or sorry, like one hit out of you know, eight shots or whatever it's got, and then um, they rolled a one on the wounds and then, like, did it again, and it was just crazy. So I, I felt like it was a, almost a little bit of a free game in terms of, like, I've just never seen dice that slanted. Like, it was yeah. across the board. Every unit just couldn't roll. Um, so it wasn't a lot of, like, crazy plays because, unfortunately, the game, like, the her dice just, like, didn't let her play the game. Like, it was just, like, yeah. a hard respect. It didn't kill a rhino. Like, it was just, like... She couldn't. She couldn't roll, and so it was. Uh, it was a little bit of a, a free game, but it was a really. She was a really fun opponent. She was a ton of class. Um, she was a great time. Yep. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, and second round. Then Space Wolves. Um, Space Wolves. The highlight was. Um, I think. Uh, I charged. I baited out um, a charge from Bjorn with Avocado, and then responded with six Exalted Eight Bar Arms. And then wrapped my jackals around the outside of Bjorn to make sure that Thunderwolf Cavalry couldn't respond and charge my eight bound. What happened was Bjorn survived the Exalted on one wound remaining, and oh, so I have tell four me the jackals. jackals took him down, and so four jackals 
Um, and it wasn't even like the dishonor. It was like one rando with like a plastic bottle, like just beating. Um, <laughs> like it was so good. Like just the one wound. Like I know, I know it's one wound, and so anything can happen. It's just, but you don't expect jackals to do that. I was just, yeah. I, was, I was praying, I was hoping. Um, but no, so that was that was a pretty fun highlight, and obviously that set up a big play where like his Thunderwolf cavalry just couldn't respond to the Exalted now, yeah. and had to kill jackals, and then Exalted get a free pickup. So it sounds like one. you played that quite well because the biggest weaknesses of those Thunderwolves is they can't go over enemy models and they can't go through walls. So if you're able to pin exactly. one of the units between a wall and then wrap your jackals mm. around, and this is one of the other reasons why. I really like the jackals over the spawn because the jackals have mm -hmm. that big yep. footprint that can actually do tricks like this. Whereas if you had a spawn unit, you probably wouldn't have been able to pull that off. So yep. sounds like you you know what tools you need and you know how to use them, and that's a really good example there of some sort of you know technical play. That's that's what I think world leaders require in order to get these results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people look at the faction and they think it's just oh yeah cool you just advance and charge and you just kill everything. It's like no 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 that will lose games. You actually have yep. to play a really technical, very like tempered game where you 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 know sequence things correctly. So, yeah, that's a really fantastic yeah. example. Uh, how about the yeah. the next round? Uh, just carry the the highlight was so my the theme for almost all of my games, not in not just this tournament in general, is like mass aggression, and I'm talking like more than your average world leader. Like I'll make ridiculous first turn charges because I can't help myself. Yeah. In this game, I think I made six first turn charges against the Drukari. Like he oh, went wow. on the line um for the most part. Um, but screened with like mandrakes and stuff like that. Um and I just kind of like assumed that I would be an idiot if I just put my army in front of him and tried to like take all that stuff out. And I got either I got let's say lucky on dice as well. Like I got some really good advance rolls. Um, but I went in with uh, six exalted, three exalted, three eight bound, three eight bound avocado, and I think a jackal unit. Um, and I just picked so much stuff up, and like all of the charges happened, all of the kills happened. I cleared the screen with the the um, regular eight bound, and then picked up like Talos and a Venom with other eight bound, the exalted. Um, yeah, it was just a really strong open. It ended up being a reasonably close game considering. Um, because the hitback was quite strong, like all my stuff is just out in the open, but I bodied him on primary um, yeah. because he was just stuck. So like, um, yeah, there was a couple, uh, and then I, I guess one more a little fun highlight was um, Avocado was going to charge two units of the Scourges, the ones with the Dark Lances. Yep. He was just going to like kill kill one of them and touch the other one. His shooting was going to be shut down and it was going to be game over. He overwatched me with one of the units and killed him with two lances. Oh, no. And I was just like, what? <laughs> no. So it made the game a lot closer than it maybe should have been. But that was a, that was a really fun game. Um, in terms of the, uh, the ad mech game, what is the highlight there? And that was just a, like, the whole game was just a highlight. It was a slog. Like, he just, he just was like, I'm going to score as many points as humanly possible with 400 ad mech units that are all trash. Yeah. Um, you just have to try to cut through me in time. And I had, I think I have 11 units in my army after you attach characters. So I have t 12 technical units, but it's 11 once you attach Moda, the, the um, yeah. super squad. I had eight of them or nine of them in combat turn one. <laughs> and and I didn't and they and they fought every single turn on unless they were dead. Yeah. For five turns. I didn't table him and I only lost uh three exalted and I think that's I think that might be it. I think wow. I lost like three exalted and a and a and a jackal unit. I mean that's so I lost almost no right? one Pardon? Yeah, that's so like yeah, it was just like just like it was crazy like that like fighting the entire game with my entire army and i couldn't table them like it was just yeah. a re it's a really so it was just such a fun like bodies everywhere so it was crazy it was fun um i love zach who's my last game um obviously that's a special one in my heart because it's the, the the tournament winning game but by far the best game was uh versus tim in round five uh he's probably the best if not one of the best players in canada um yep. An amazing dude, very very strong player. 
um, and runs a, a savage Eldar army. Um, the highlight there was once again another low light. Uh, once again with Avocado, um, he needed a four inch charge to connect with two D cannons to shut them down. Um, I got greedy and I was like, you know what? What I'll do is I'll throw this grenade at the second D cannon because Avocado has a lot of attacks, but not a lot of attacks to kill to split and kill two different D cannons. Yeah. So I'll throw a grenade at one D cannon, put the Rhino horn into that one, and then kill the other one with the main attacks. Um, I'm only need a four inch charge. It's fine. So I use my CP, get my three mortal wounds off on that D cannon. It only has two wounds left. Rhino horn's gonna clean that up, no problem. And I roll a three on the charge and no CP now. Oh, and no. Like, oh my god. Um, so uh, he ends up getting picked up by some D cannons, um, and uh, it was uh, that made the game really, really tight. And so, um, on another fun anecdote was while we were explaining our lists, I went to pick up one of my berserkers and uh, stabbed myself on the power pack and started bleeding. So he knew I was going to win. Like immediately, yeah. it was over. That's a good omen. Um, yeah. For um, most people, if you start bleeding, that's yeah, a problem. Corn, that's something you should be me, concerned me. about. But for a world leaders player, that means Corn's yeah. watching. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great. Um, last game, Sisters. Um, Sisters was a fun game, man. That was uh, that was so. Um, at that point, I was five and zero, oh, and I was like, you know what? This is house money. I I'm like, I don't if I win or if I lose, like it's not a big deal. Um, yeah. I want to have so much fun. Uh, I really enjoyed being on stream. Um, I love showing off the world leaders and the play style. Um, and so it was really fun to just um, play Zach. I think the highlight was, once again, early aggression. I think I charged with four or five units. I don't remember. The, the people who watched the stream can remind me. But, but um, yeah, I got I got really aggressive really early cause, just because I wanted to like shut some of that stuff down. He gave me a little bit of an opening in the middle um, into some vehicles. And of course, like a true world leader, I took bring it down and assassinate because I can't help myself. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to kill as much stuff as possible, as fast as possible to, uh, make it harder on him to play the game. And it ended up working out. It was a, it was a good game, tight game. And, uh, yeah, that was on stream. And so I highly recommend going to check that one out. The Warhammer community suffers from some of the most prohibitively expensive essentials in the world especially Australian content creators. Every single day, Dean wants to create content, but he can't. Suffering from old, worn-out brushes, expensive model kits, and costly software and equipment, he can't endure much longer. Just look at this dirty paint water. Would you drink this? Would you let your child? Even a small monthly donation can help provide Dean with clean paint water, basic tools for survival, and access to life-saving information and education. So please, follow the links in the description below and find out how you can sponsor a mad cunt like Dean today and end the suffering. Suffering that is cruel, unsustainable, and your fault. Yeah, I watched that stream whilst I was supposed to be working. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a fascinating game. There was some really interesting stuff in there, so I'll put a link to that as well. So we've got all the, the all the background reading. If people want to go check that out, that's all there. Um, and given that you've already covered on all of that sort of stuff, what I thought would be really interesting is talking about the factions that you didn't get an opportunity to play against. So if people want to know what you did play, they can go check out the Red Path stuff. Uh, but this conversation, yep. I think we centre it around the factions that you didn't get an opportunity to play and what your thoughts are on those matchups and how you would go about approaching them. Um, because there's a few... Yeah, for sure. There's a few really popular factions in the meta that you didn't have the opportunity to play against, and I think they're also some mm -hmm. of the ones that World Leaders players often struggle with. Um, yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the factions we'll go through will be uh, Custodes, Necrons, Ironstorm, Death Guard, Chaos Knights, Imperial Guard, Thousand Sons, Grey Knights... Tau, and then the mirror match. So that's 10 factions we want to talk right. about. So uh, if we can maybe try to we'll run through know, it, run through it, rapid fire, sort of, you know, spend maybe five minutes telling me about your thoughts on each one of those. Um, and then if yep. there's any in particular that we want to expand on, we can. Um, but I don't yep. want to make this a, a four hour long video because I'm sure you've got better <laughs> things to do today than uh, talk to me. So 
Uh, let's start with the Custodies. This is one that, um, you know, a lot of World Eaters players really struggle with. They have access to the fights first, which is a problem. They can 4-up Funa Pain, that's a problem. And they can also neg one damage, which really yep. hurts our 8-bound. So what are your sort of thoughts on yep, for sure. the standard Custodies matchup? And how do you sort of view it uh, from the World Eaters perspective? So I've played um, Custodies twice since the data slate. Um, I have won both games. They were both at events. Um, it was a, a team tournament where I intentionally took the matchup uh, because I wanted to play it and try it. Um, it is by far and away our hardest matchup. Um, I think that it takes mistakes on the opponent's side or some poor rolling or just you being really, really good. Um, like, like... One of the things is that we often, I think it takes a little bit of a mental switch, because one of the things that we often don't have an advantage on other armies over is model and unit count. Yep. And that's one thing that we will likely have in the Custodes matchup. So in the Custodes matchup, like the most meta lists are like three Wardens, three um, Guard units, and then like either like Sisters or like Alaris to like back them up kind of thing. Um, there's some lists that are like two Wardens or two Guard lists, or Guard units, and then like a couple Tanks. But um, for the most part, I'm, I'm thinking infantry spam when I'm thinking yep. custodes. I agree. Um, one of the things this opens up that war leaders don't often think about is free deployment. Um, you don't, we don't get shot. <laughs> like, it's yep. very hard for them to shoot us. Um, you just measure out some distances in terms of like what the ranges are depending on what the weapons they have are. Um, and even still, you're talking about strength for AP1. Um, so if you can, you know, get Angron on the line and put a wing tip behind a building, they're wounding on sixes and he's got two up saves. And so, like, do you you don't need to hide Angron, which makes it a lot easier to move him around. I play most commonly, and the tournament was played most. Um, the tournament was played on WTC terrain, um, which is harder to move your big melee monsters around and, and vehicles in general. Um, so I think taking advantage of some of the deployment. Um, openings that another melee army gives you is important. We often think that we have to protect our units, and that's usually true. Um, but in this case, you don't have to. You get a little bit more free deployment. And then you can also swarm units and opponent units a little better. Um, I think, obviously, we talk about fight first as a big problem. Um, there's ways around that. Obviously, um, generally, one of the, the biggest tools is hitting a, a unit, killing that unit, and then piling into the fight first unit. That's not really an option in the Custodes list because they have either so few units or all of them can fight first, um, depending on if they're touching an objective. I think that's the big one, is you have to look for those openings. Um, sometimes they'll roll a crappy advance roll and either have to take themselves off an objective or stay back. Sometimes they'll fail a charge roll and not be able to get onto the objective. Um, like With such low unit counts, they have to make every dice roll count, and that's not how dice work. Like, eventually, they're going to, like, get a, a failure point, and when that happens, you really need to jump on it. If you can catch a Custodes unit off an objective, there's no fights first, there is minus one damage, but we have the damage to get through that most of the time, um, especially if you're, you're dogpiling this unit. Um, another big thing is... Um, Using obviously using your your tools to avoid fight first. Otherwise, uh, your jackals get get as many based custodies in, as possible with your jackals. Let them kill a bunch of jackals, and then your eight bound, your mo, your angron fights fights free there. I, it, it's a very tough matchup. You just have to understand what your tools are, what their tools are. Um, like it's very low shooting. Um, they'll give you blood search. Like it, they they have a very poor profile to killing realistically anything. Um, and the shoot twice isn't is actually a shoot twice. Like they shoot once, you blood surge, and then they shoot again. So you yeah. could shut down the second shooting, or you can blood surge twice. Um, yeah. They won't pick up ten berserkers, especially if you're in cover, and especially if you have the feel no pain. So they even either won't bother shooting your your berserkers, um, which is great, or if they do, they're giving you free movement, maybe getting into combat with Mo, uh, and his fight first in their turn, which means that you fight first. Um, yeah, I, there's. it's really hard to dissect that matchup without knowing their specific list, um, but with my list, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to um, dogpile units or um, trigger four-ups early, especially in the Wardens. 
like you were alluding to, and I talked about in the Red Path video, um, you can throw those three eight bound with the three damage champion and sustained hits, and they have to gamble. And they're saying either we're not going to pop the four up, and hopefully you don't make any wound rolls, which we have wound rerolls on that unit um, on strength 10, or you're propping the four up, and now my next volley, which will be stronger, is going to hit you harder. Yeah. And so I think that's, like, there's a there's a ton of little tools. It's still an incredibly difficult matchup. Don't get it twisted. Um, there will be, like, we will suffer into that matchup a lot. Um, but I do think there are tools if you study their list and your list and you know what your list does and kind of take advantage of the interesting quirks of that matchup um, that you can, that that's when very winnable. Yeah. I also think one of the big elements in that matchup is Angron. Uh, the custodians, mm -hmm. if you charge, especially if it's not a unit of guard on an objective, if you charge like a unit of wardens or a unit of guard mm -hmm. that's not controlling an objective, they actually really struggle to put hurt on Angron because we yep. also have access to a neg one damage stratagem. So yep. being able to go, cool, I'm just gonna send Angron into that unit, I'm gonna put neg one damage on him. Even if you fight first, you're gonna do almost no damage to me. And then Angron's gonna, you know, he probably only kills two or three because they have the four up and vulnerable saves, etc. But still taking out three custodians is an actually massive deal. So yep. 100%. Yeah, I think it's like, this, like you said, I think it is our hardest matchup, but I think it is a winnable one. And uh, yeah, I think, combining all of those sorts of elements is, is the best way to go about you know increasing your odds of winning that matchup. Yeah. One more little trick in that matchup that I forgot to mention is um, threatening a pile-in and fight. Um, so if you charge, let's say they've used a sister's unit as a screen, um, and then you can pot, but you, like, I, this actually happened in a game where I charged a sister's unit that was uh, screened, and he made a little bit of a mistake with placement here, right? Um, the unit was on an objective, um, so could trigger the fights first. It was also Trajan's unit. Um, but, so what I made a huge charge with Angron, and I charged over the sisters, which meant I, if my 8-bound killed the sisters, which they were going to, um, then Angron gets to pile in the Trajan's unit. And now Trajan has to decide at the start of the fight phase whether to fight first, activate a 2-up in Vuln, um, all those strats, they happen at the start of the fight phase. I'm not in combat with you yet. And so I get to know what you're doing with your activation before I make the decision of whether I want to commit my resource to that fight this yep. round. And so you can just bait out with a pile, with a potential pile in and fight activations. Like they, like if that was a warden squad, you probably have to activate the four up. Like, yeah. And I'm like, maybe I don't even, maybe I don't even go into you. Like, maybe I don't even take the damage if I'm not going to do damage to you. And then I have a full health Angron sitting in front of you, and you have to find a way to deal with that. Yeah. Like, This is one thing so, I talk about quite often, is that um, sometimes just having the ability to do something is as good yeah. as doing it, right? Just having yeah. the ability to pile into them so that you can stare yeah. them in the eyes and be like, I can go into you. Do you want to use your abilities? Yeah. That's yeah. almost as good as going in because you just go cool. You force them to use their abilities, and then you don't go in. And now you didn't have to sacrifice a piece, but they did have to sacrifice their resources. Same goes with you know, having at the start of every one of your turn, uh, your opponent's turns, you want to make sure you have two CP, just so that yep. they know they can't charge two units because if they charge two, they're going to fight one. You're going to interrupt with the other. So just having the two CP means they're not going to engage in you like that. And then you don't have to spend the two CP on that stratagem because yep. they, didn't, they didn't go in because they were worried that you would. So I think having the ability to do something is often as powerful as doing it. So, and yep. that's exactly what you're talking about there. For sure. All right. Cool. Um, uh, let's, unless you've got anything else on custodians, let's nope. jump into Necrons. Um, this is the easiest of our, of like the top end factions for me. Um, okay. I think that Necrons, um, in either of their lists, they have two different main lists, right? You have the Canoptic Court or the Hyper, uh, Hypercrypt. Um, in the Canoptic Court, they're going to say, we're going to stand in front of you and not die. And we're going to be like, and we just were like, no, sorry, that doesn't work here. Like, we don't, we don't buy that. We have the attack volume, we have the attack strength, we have the damage. We get through um, all of those pieces. If you bring three Catan and triple rates to us, um, I can pick up two of those a turn, um, and it's not overly difficult. Um 
you just like wolf pack everything together. It's a saying that I have. Um, it's just like you run everyone together and get those overlapping auras. You got your fight first mo. Um, it's very hard for um, Canoptic Court to deal with something like that. Um, and then you just take them off the objectives. And once they start losing pieces, they they lose the ability. Similar to Custode, they lose the ability to play the game. Um, like all of a sudden, they're losing pieces faster than they thought they would, and now um, they don't know how to score their secondaries. Um, it's still a difficult matchup. You can get diced. Bad things can happen. Like I'm not saying it's an auto win. I think that we can't. We have the tools to do exactly what they think they. We have the tools to handle exactly what they think they can do. Like they want to just rock up to the middle and exist. We have the the ability to just say no. You can't. Yeah. And so, what does their list do now? Because realistically, that list doesn't have a lot of t- a lot of tricks, a lot of tools. It has we're durable AF. We're gonna live here. Um, and so. Yeah. I find a lot of Necron players are also like overconfident because they're so Mm -hmm. used to people bouncing off their stuff that they'll put something out thinking you're going to bounce. And then when you combine Angron's reroll hits, the eight bounds reroll ones to wound, and then a billion attacks from Corn Berserkers, there's almost nothing that that doesn't kill. So nobody Uh, should look at that. It's a very very small list. (laughs) It's a very small list. Yeah. Um... So, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe armor of contempt terminators of some some description is yeah red, like, like a redemptor like with yeah a redemptor with like armor of contempt is one of those ones and even then like it's close yeah um, but I uh, think um, I think the key in that Necron matchup also and I'm sure you've experienced this is making sure that you're using the right tool for the right job like mm-hmm. the, eight, the exalted eight bound going into Katan is feels bad because they're yep. halving your damage output they're not doing fantastic. However, the Exalted Eight Bound into the Wraiths feels fine. So, whereas the Berserkers yeah, going into the Katan feels fine. So, I think yep. it's just a matter of making sure that you get your pieces where you want. And I think that's ultimately the World Eater's biggest strength, is because they're so fast, you yep. can choose who fights who. You can't. It's very yep. difficult for your opponent to dictate those fights. Uh, what's some Absolutely. advice you have, perhaps, for getting around like the reactive move on the Wraiths? or the teleporting Catan, if people play those sorts of... Uh, um, so the big thing with the teleporting Catan is it can't charge afterwards, which is where most of its damage output comes from. Um, it still can shoot you, like it's obviously going to... But you, you can't really stop that, to be honest. Um, one of the things that I I do is I try to... Um, I try to do unimportant moves first. Um someone has a reactive move that way um maybe i can bait out a reactive move from a player who's antsy to use it um if they know what they're doing and they know what i'm doing there's nothing i can do that's really going to stop that um what you can do is you can try to move in a wide net to give yourself more options sometimes doing that takes models out of realistic fight range like it's one thing to have the left guy in charge four inches away but maybe if you strung out, that back guy is like 12 or 14 inches away. And so if you make a five inch charge, he's not fighting. Um, so like you have to kind of balance giving yourself options versus just taking your models out of the fight. Um, and sometimes it's obviously better to have three models fighting than six. Uh, it's rather better than zero out of six. So um, with the reactive move, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just give myself multiple options and try to and try to use that. I'll let them do what they need to do. Um, for the most part, it's it's really difficult to stop a very good player from doing it. Um, and then uh, some of the other players, you know, what you can do is you can try to bait it out early with some other moves. There are some like, little tricks, but it's really difficult to pull off realistically. Um, reactive moves are just maybe one of the strongest roles in the game. It's just very hard to, to, to stop and, and plan for yeah, um, yeah, they just kind of get to do it and you hope they roll low <laughs> yep yep that more or less checks out um, um for hype hy- for hypercrypt i think it's a little different you actually alluded to it we're fast um they they teleport around and that's great we are fast and the second they get touched there's no more teleport yeah and they don't once again unless um if, if it's no monolith list it, it's they're screwed like they're just they get touched and it's over like they're just dying um or they fall back and then we charge them and as long as their overwatch isn't insane um then it's just going to be rinse repeat 
beat him up. And so we use this. They'll still have Catan. Um, they might still have Wraiths. We know we have those tools. Um, so like you, you know, save your Berserkers for the Catan. Make sure your Wraiths get hunted down by eight bound. And you can even just use Jackals to touch Destroyers. So like they won't kill them in melee, and you're just not fighting now. Like yeah. or shooting now. So um, against a Monolith list, obviously it's a little different. Um, you need to make sure that you're wiping units when you're con- when you're coming in contact with them to make sure that there's no um, teleport away. Um, and then for the monoliths themselves, Angron. Like, you, you just got to get Angron into those monoliths. Um, yeah. You can get six Exalted into a monolith. Um, they will do some damage. You just make sure that you're using all your tools to make sure that that's reliable. Plus one to wound, rerolling wounds if you can from other eight bound. Um, because the last thing you want to see is those guys mostly kill a monolith and then get slapped back by it. It's It can hit pretty hard. Um, it also shoots pretty hard too, so we were making sure that uh, you're using cover appropriately from those things. You're never going to stop the three inch deep strike, and I recommend that you don't even try. Yeah. Like, play your game, do your thing. If you sweat out trying to block every inch of the board, you're going to lose so much mobility and so much scoring. Let them three inch deep strike and react to it when you can. That may sound like shitty advice. As long as you're not like letting a monolith in your back lines, I don't know where we've seen that before. Um, then, uh, <laughs> then uh... Well, yeah. no, I completely agree, and I think uh, I think a lot of players they they sort of get a bit psyched out by things like three inch deep strikes, yeah. and then they end up wasting like four or five premium assets in their army to try to block out this one move that your opponent can do. And then, as a result, you're out of position, you're not threatening primary, you're not threatening your opponent's, you know, home objective or anything like that. And then your opponent goes, cool, that's achieved more than what the three-inch deep strike in your backfield would have done, right? Because they've essentially neutralized all half of your army that you've used as an attempt to neutralize them. So I think when you view it as a trade and you go, cool, well, I could trade all of these units to stop you from doing this trick. But now I'm losing all of those units. Whereas if instead yeah. I let you do the trick and you kill one of those units, well, that's obviously a better trade. So, yeah, I think that's actually good advice. It sounds counterintuitive, but I think you're on the money there. I, I think and one last one with the um, uh, the Necron Hypercrypt is that it's strategic reserves. Those units go into strategic reserves, not deep track. It's not Grey Knights, come wherever you want. Yeah. It's that unit goes into strategic reserves, which gives you a lot more leeway um, in where they come from and where their offensive abilities are going to come from. The three-inch deep strike, the three-inch deep strike is a deep strike, um, but everything else is a reserves. And so, no deployment zone, um, only sit within six inches of the board edge, wholly within. And so, like those are easier. To, like if you just like run jackals up the side of the board, <laughs> like have fun bringing your own units back in your own deployment zone, or yeah, like absolutely on a rhino up the side, or whatever. Right, like. Um, if, if it is, there is limitations to the hypercrypt, um, and especially without monoliths, they don't have a ton of great tools. Um, and then if they do have monoliths, they don't have a high model count. And so, um, I think, I think we have the ability to beat whichever Necron list. I think we can, we can do those pretty reliably in my opinion. Um, you just gotta, like, once again, understanding what tool goes where and how to use it, um, is, is important. Yep. No, yeah, that, that's all I have for Necrons, I think. Yep, no, I think that's all some really good advice. I think people will get a lot out of that. Uh, the next one is probably one of the most common armies, uh, simply because it's what almost everybody has access to, and that's the Iron yep. Storm Marines. They're everywhere at the moment, and yeah. uh, they're very popular. They're doing really good results. They put out a ton of damage. What's your thoughts yep. on, on how we as Worldians players can sort of get around that? Um... So I don't have any experience, direct experience, into the Dark Angels double Storm Raven gunship list. Um, I've seen it. I've TO'd events where it's played, and I know it's scary. Um, I would treat I treat them like I would treat a Redemptor um, in terms of, like, what needs to kill it, and that's Angron. Um, you can dogpile... Redempt, like so like we'll talk about like redemptors and storm ravens and stuff like that in like a one vein because they're similar yeah. durability um you can dogpile them um but it's uh it's it's hard right so uh your exalted are a really good tool even with the minus one damage 
Um, and the reason is, is their AP. Uh, yeah. Two up save with AOC is so tough to get through. Um, I know that they're still saving on fours, but like you've got 26 attacks. Like assume you're rerolling everything because you've made sure that you're crashing their castle. Um, you've got 26 attacks, rerolling everything, hopefully with exploding sixes, rerolling your ones to wound or just twin linked on the champion. That's a lot of reliable, like you're forcing those saves. If 20, like if 26 attacks go through or, you know, 20, 23, they're saving on fours, divide that by half. You have almost killed the Redemptor. Like the Redemptor's got 13 wounds, right? Like that's, it's a lot of damage. And so maybe if you've thrown a grenade beforehand, done a little tank shock, um, get lucky and they roll low on saves, like you can absolutely kill it. And then if you maybe throw another unit in there, like a unit of eight bound, you'll pick it up almost certainly, especially if you've got all that going for you. Angron, I've had picked him pick up two Redemptors at once multiple times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, like, it's, people say, I, I've heard so many times, what kind of idiot will put their Redemptors beside each other? Uh, that's how Ironstorm does it. Like, they, they have a exactly. castle of six-inch yeah. auras um, with lethal hits and fallback to sh and advance and shoot. Um, and then they've got the blank one damage. Um, and they want to be nice and close. Also, Redemptor's bases are huge. Terrain is a thing. There's only so many sight lines. And Angron's base is huge. So if those he's over four inches wide. So if those guys are within six inches of each other, you can fit him between them, be within an inch of either of them, and split attacks. Yeah. Um, and so it's not automatic. I've had it happen a couple times, but it doesn't mean it's automatic. But he will do severe damage to both of them if not pick them up. Um, you do five attacks into one, four attacks in the other. Hope for some exploding sixes. Get those re rolls. Um, our plus one to wound works on as many vehicles as you are in combat with. Um, so if you pr play the plus one to wound on Angron, he will get plus one to wound against both um, of those vehicles, which is awesome. Um, and then he's wounding on twos with eight bound nearby. You're rerolling the ones. So basically, you're just like auto hitting with hopefully some exploding sixes. And yeah. so then you've got AP four. Um, one of them may have AOC. One of them definitely won't. And so they're saving on sixes. Um, you need two or three wounds to go through to kill one. It's it's not. It's not unlikely. Um, and so um, if you can get, obviously get that playoff, it's huge. Um, but in general, um, they'll start, usually those lists have like a scouts unit of some kind, um, either scouts or infiltrators to try to, try to stop our forward momentum. Um, it depends on how good those players are with their placement of those things. Um, sometimes um, they'll give you, the staging pieces you literally just charge the unit hide behind that terrain piece kill it and wait for your turn to go turn um and that's where i really like my favorite of corn to make sure on that turn too i have my advance in charge because i'm probably a little farther away than i want to be um so then needing needing angron up six inches is uh an extra six inches is great um but i think that iron storm it like there's so many list variants um Make sure that, like, usually there's Inceptors in almost any Marine list, let alone Ironstorm, but Ironstorm will have them too. Make sure if you're using Jackals on your home, get the Dishonored on the objective. Uh, he's got a 40 mil base. The objective markers are 40 millimeters wide. They can't deep strike within, they can deep strike outside of three. So 3.1 away is not mathematically possible to be on your objective as long as you just have one Dishonored directly on the, the objective token. Yep, that's fantastic. Um, and so that, that just, like, you just can't deep strike on it. If you need one model and you can just stop one model with a 40 mil base and you stop any deep strike on your home objective. Um, and then you can use your little other little jackals to screen out or maybe trail them back into cover um, so that when those Inceptors come down and start blasting away, they actually don't have that many shots. Um, the bolter ones will get a little bit extra, um, especially if they're lucky, um, but they're not going to oath your jackals. And so you've got what nine is it nine shots it's nine it's nine shots with no re-rolls that's you know six hits they'll get it probably two sixes you're, you're probably not picking up the squad which allows you to keep your icon and stuff like that especially if you have cover um and you're getting a few sixes to save and then a couple lucky double feel no pains um and then you chase those inceptors down with the jug lord um and uh and smash him and once again plasma inceptors they probably like they they might kill a juglord um they're 
you know, but they won't oath him, so they might, you know, miss a few. Like it's not, re- it's not reliably killing him with your invul and with missing. Um, they, uh, they have the opportunity to, but it's not automatic. And then yeah. he, he just picks up a unit of three inceptors. Yeah, and this is why I really like the Jug Lord. I completely agree with you. I think he's a must. I think he's fantastic because not only does he give you something that can hang out in your backfield. It's not a super critical piece, you know, mid board or, or yep. in your opponent's deployment zone. So he's he's happy to hang out with your jackals and just, you know, sink some beers while they're waiting for the opponent to rock up. And when they yep. do rock up, he's really good at going in and killing them. And the favorite of corn, even though it is only once per game, it mitigates our biggest lose condition. And that is that, that turn when you need to go, if you don't get advance and charge, now you probably just lose. So anything yeah. you can do to, to make that less likely, I think is something that you must do just because it's such a disaster if it does happen. Um, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I, I, I obviously really like it. It's in my list for a reason. I think yeah. that it's very important to make, to make sure that we're continuing to be aggressive. I think that's, that's, our, that's our faction. We're designed that way. We want to be aggressive. Um, we can stuff primary just by, you know, preventing our opponent from either living or like sticking them in their deployment zone. Both of those, you know, you want advance and charge to go off. Um, I don't think it's absolutely a, like a, like a must take. I think that it's a very strong take. I think there's lists that could play more counter punchy. Um, yeah. There's, there's options, but I'm in my style of play. Like, obviously I'm making 90 first turn charges every game. Apparently um, yeah. I, I want my <laughs> advance and charge. So, yeah. um, so, um, yeah, I think like in in Ironstorm to build to build on that, like it's it's really tough um, because there's so much list variance. Like Lancers are savage, yeah, also executioners yeah. are savage. Um, Demons with the Overwatch. I mean, I mean the bet the best thing there is terrain. Like I, it sounds dumb, but like don't be shot. Like wait behind terrain until you're ready to clap back. Um, you sprint out, crush them. They don't have phenomenal Overwatch. Unless they're an insanely good player, and what they'll some I would have seen some players do is not is use their oaths target on a target that's going to charge them. Yes. And just use like regular abilities to kill the stuff that's in front of them because they do have high damage output. They don't really need oaths. So they'll oath a target that they want to Overwatch. Yeah. And then, yes. um, and then so like your six eight bound come out around the corner, and a repulsor executioner with full rerolling hits is killing half of them or something like that. It's not doesn't feel great um but uh yeah you just make sure you use a train avoid overwatch if you can using from moving from one train to another piece um get your cover and uh yeah hunt down those i i like i like hunting down the characters with eight bound actually that's a, a fun little thing that i started doing um i'm sure that it's not unique to me but uh those characters are huge um yep. like uh le- lethal hits blanking a save every battle round is annoying yeah, if you um, can remove those tech marines, it becomes a much different yeah. game. And, and they don't they don't live long. Like eight, two eight bound, uh, three eight bound will kill, pick them up easy. So, um, yeah, ma- just making sure that you're uh, you're removing the pieces. Um, obviously, they don't just let you do that. So it it just highly depends on the list. But I think that um, that's a more straight up game where you can just like I'm going to creep forward, use the train to my advantage, and yeah. uh, castle crash. Make sure your buffs are overlapping because they are durable. They are annoying. Um, hopefully you have a good train, um, and then you can, uh, you can exploit that and make sure that you're taking the least amount of damage before you get to hit them before they hit you reliably. Yeah. I feel like that's one of the missions or one of the, one of the matchups, I should say, uh, where our standard playbook is most effective, you know, where it's like, cool, they're going to, they're going to have a castle. They're going to have lots of units nearby. So taking your six man, eight bound, charging one thing, and then trying to pile in and tag a whole bunch of stuff so that in their turn, if they try to fall back. They have to pass multiple battle shocks in order to, to do so. You know that's a good trick, and that's a trick that we should be using in almost every matchup. But it's particularly relevant here. You know, using Angron to charge yeah. into two units, splitting his attacks, and hoping for double kills. That's something we should be trying to do as often as possible. But it's particularly relevant here. So yeah. I think you touched on that really, really well at the start. And I think uh, the Ironstorm players are so used to just always castling up because they get so much utility from their buffs mm-hmm. that they'll probably fall for that trap most often. Yep. Yeah, I think the, the, the Marine matchup is one that uh, it's really hard. Like, the stats are wonky because we all know Marine stats are, like, in the toilet because there's so many Marine players that just play for, 
for yeah. lols and then um but like it's a very strong list like played it played at a competitive level it's, the marines are very strong but i think we have a decent matchup into them yeah absolutely all right what Uh, Death Guard, our brothers from uh, from another mother. Ooh. This one, um, I think, is a really interesting matchup. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. I think I don't think this is as difficult as some people think that it is. Um, I think that Death Guard has a big, scary, um, uh, I guess, reputation. That said, um, I do want more reps into it. I like I'm. I've argued with a couple of really good players that I respect um, that like, I'm like, I don't think this is as hard as it, as it, you guys are making it out to be. Um, but like when good players speak, I listen. Um, even if I consider myself a good player, like yeah. I don't consider myself like the end all be all. Like I, I'm open to being wrong. Um, so making sure that I'm listening to other players, I think that it's a positive matchup for us, though. That's, so having that said that, I think it's a positive matchup for us, but not, like, a crazy positive. Like, I think we can win, but, like, by 10 points. Like, um, one of the things, so my most common uh, iteration of the list that I've run into um, that I've had success against is Plague Marine, Bricks, and Rhinos, obviously, with the Biologus and the... Light spawn the the yep. fight first guy and the uh, the lethal grenades, hits guy, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, lethal hits grenades guy, whatever whatever yeah, yeah. we're calling him. Um, and then um, we got a couple of rhinos. Obviously, that they, they can't exist without rhinos. Um, lots of nerglings. So you know, between two and four units of nerglings commonly. Um, they could be the Morty plague burst crawler lock, um, and it could be. Some plague burst crawlers, some predators, um, like drones. Uh, usually, a, almost always now, a lone typhus, like a single typhus. Um, so that's the kind of archetype that I'm talking about when I'm when we're fighting this. Yep. Um, I think that we can trade into those nerglings who are going to scout block us 100% um, effectively early game, um, and they don't have. Like especially so once again if they're if they're not on with their nerglin placement and we can get some um, leverage some of those kills into hiding in terrain, um, that's going to be really effective. Obviously, um, alternatively, you just charge like nonsense and like like jackals will will probably pick up some nerglings. Like a lot, um, even though the nerglings are minus one to hit in melee and so jackals will be hitting on fives. Um, if you can like trail, you know, one back into Angron, who's maybe behind a building, not getting shot or something like that. Um, you get the rerolls on like eight of them, and they're just gonna mess up a, a Nurgling brick because they have no save. Um, 
or they do they have a save when it's a six up um and then or you can you know i have and will continue to you know throw away avocado relatively early he can move fast which means he can get behind the building and get the charge angle that i want and then he'll pick up a unit of nerglings um and then once you pick up the unit of nerglings um or the, the nerglings um, depending on the the list the opponent has actually lost a lot of their scoring that's actually a thing that i find commonly with people who want to scout block us is in every one of their other matchups those are their scoring pieces yeah scouts nerglings mandrakes like that's what they like in their head they score with all the time and now in their match now in their matchups they're like oh no world leaders can do the thing we're gonna block them all those units are dead now yeah and so and they don't realize that if they wanted to avoid our our alpha strike all they have to do is deploy a few inches back you know like yeah. we can go deep but we can't go that deep so if they deploy a yeah. little bit yeah. back and then hold those resources yeah. They can have their cake yep. and eat it too, but I agree. They often, they often see you. You tell them how far you can move. You're like, I can move 23 yep. inches and then charge, and they spaz out, and then they put all of their models in front of you, and they just sacrifice all of their utility. Yep. So the, a lot, a lot of the times, those players they sacrifice all their utility, their scoring pieces, and then all of a sudden, it's three plague, plague burst crawlers in the back, Morty, and two rhinos with dudes in it, and maybe a couple plague drones and a typhus. Yeah. I don't like now now we just get free reign to move around. We're just like they're they're not like they're stationary essentially. Like that you that that is all just like slowly coming up at you. And so then you kind of position yourself, make sure that you're initiating the combats. Um Typhus is a pain in the butt, um, but he's pretty killable. Like especially lone typhus, he doesn't have the minus one to hit, um, unless they activate the minus one weapon skill, in which case, thank your lucky stars, because Minus one save is way worse. Um, we can get around a minus one weapon skill um, with sustained hits, Angron's rerolls. Um, we have wound rerolls, and so like, yeah, we we have a fairly consistent attack dice um, sorting. But like, minusing our save is horrendous because um, yeah, then their flames really pop off. All, all their all their stupid zero AP one AP stuff turns into like minus two minus three ap all of a sudden very quickly and you're like oh my god how is this happening to me um and yeah no you've got stupid things picking up units so um understanding that like their stuff is often killier than it says on the box because of that um like minus one state which is what i think all death guard players should be running almost all of the time unless it's like demons then yeah sure weapons go um but um yeah, Typhus is a little bit annoying, but you can pick him up with I mean, probably the Jug Lord. Like, you shoot him with a plasma pistol, you more, do the one mortal that you're going to do to him, and then, you know, you've got your a lot of two damage attacks, and he's got five wounds, so... Um, you do one wound before that, and then afterwards it's uh, it's two failed saves, and Typhus is dead. Um, but um, in terms of the Plague Burst Crawlers... They, I feel like they look scarier than they are, assuming that you're protecting yourself from contagion range. Um, so they have their strength eight, AP two, two flat damage. Um, Mortarian lets them ignore modifiers. Cover is not a modifier. Um, so we get cover. It's not a thing that affects their data sheet. So um, basically, it's zero AP unless we're in contagion range in which it could be up to minus three because they have the minus one save and then they have a strat that once you're in contagion range they can minus one your uh add an extra ap to their attacks um then it becomes scary but they're really slow <laughs> so yeah. so just making sure that you're not gonna get like like math it out uh make sure that you're outside of gonna be outside of contagion range um and then use your tricks to kill those those fight first bricks um they're in rhinos so what you can do is if the opponent is not clever enough to get their plague marines out of the rhino you know, beforehand. Um, you can crash the rhino multiple ways, either kill it with Angron and then pile in with, uh, and then also charge with the exalted eight bound, and then just pile into the plague marines who now are battle shocked, can't use any strats, and you get to fight before they do. Or you can just jackal wrap the rhino, and then plague marines don't come up to play until you're ready. Like, yeah. um, if you don't Another kill the rhino, there's no, way, so there's no way for them to get out. Um, once again, usually at the top tables in, in terms of like high end play, your death guard players are gonna be smart enough to avoid that. Um, and that then you use your tricks like 
jackal basing a bunch of them and charging them on the sides with yep. your killing units, limiting the amount of stuff that can attack your unit back. Um, a unit of 10 Berserkers picks up a unit of Plague Marines with minus one damage almost automatically. Like, as long as you're using your buffs, um, your Plague Marines aren't that tough. We have all the profiles to murder them dead. Um, so as long as you're making sure that you avoid the fights first, and then Angron going into, into Plague Marines. Like, they probably won't kill him. Yeah, um, right. Um, especially if you limit some of their attacks with like a Rhino Drift or something like that. Um, and then Mortarian, um, he just gets picked up by Angron, one activation. You're, as long as you, once again, you got to use these buffs. Um, make sure that you're all working together, rerolling hits, rerolling the wounds. Um, you got to obviously be judicious where you use plus one to wound, um, but making sure that you're getting that off. And then I don't really fear Plague Burst Crawlers too, too much. Um, yeah. They can do the damage, but they're swingy, um, especially without rerolls. Um, and uh, and yeah, you've got the four up end bones. You will lose stuff, like they 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 do damage. Um, but I feel like we can crash that castle really effectively. Yeah. Um, and we decide what hits what when, other than the plague burst crawlers, and as and that's not a ton of reliable damage. It's they'll kill your jackals, um, and but like not realistically your eight bound unless um if they get like a unit of scouts making some hail mary charge or something like that and then you have to or like hail mary advance and then you're in contagion range surprisingly just don't let that happen like kill kill fast stuff make death guard use their their big stuff to either score or fight and then they won't be able to outscore you and probably just lose the fight there's another really interesting trick that you can do, and I know you don't have Khan the Betrayer in your list. I'm a huge fan of Khan the Betrayer. Uh, and one yes. of the things you can do with Into the Death Guard, which they almost never see coming, is you, you throw Khan out on his own. I run him with no unit attached, just running on his own. Mm -hmm. You run him out, he shoots his pistol, maybe kills one, he throws a grenade, kills a couple more, and then he charges in. They fight first, kill him, but then he always fights on death. He doesn't need to roll for it. Yeah. So when he fights on death, he picks up more or less the rest of the unit. So you've now traded yeah. a 100-point Khan the Betrayer that's come out of a Rhino, and you've just picked up this big, scary, always fights first, a billion power fists in the unit, like yeah. this unit that's supposed to be a huge problem, that's supposed to flip the world in a matchup, but you yeah. can just sacrifice Khan to go deal with it. Yeah, uh, 100%. That's and there's, there's a few other tricks like that. Like You could do a similar thing with the Exalted 8-bound. You can throw them in, and then if you use your Blessings roll to get fights on death, that can work yeah. as well. That's a little bit less effective because A, you have to use one of your yeah. blessings rolls, and B, you're relying on those four ups. But it still does yeah. achieve a similar goal. If you do find yourself in a position where there's unit plague marines on an objective, and you're like, okay, cool, I can't. There's no nerglings or rhinos nearby that I can tag in order to get in. My jackals are ages yeah. away, so I can't base contact him with jackals and then charge the eight man in. I've got no other tricks available to me. You can, yeah. you know, in desperate times, you can. Hundred percent as well. Absolutely. That's definitely a, a, a valid tactic. Um, I've been burned so many times by fight on death rolls. Like, yeah. I can't seem to roll that four up. Like, I, I'll roll charges all day, but that four up, man, it eludes me. Um, but yeah, the death guard matchup, like, I, I want more reps into it. Like I said, that uh, I'm sure there's, pe there's some people hot right now thinking that I made it sound so easy. Um, it's tough. They do a lot of damage. Um, but I just don't think that they're that survivable. And I think we can kill their scoring pieces relatively quickly. Yep. and make it a really tough game for them to outscore us. And then they either have to um, lose the fight or lose the game. And I they can't. I don't think they can do reliably both if you use your pieces correctly. Yep. I but I'm, I'm happy to be wrong there. Yeah, I, I think it's, it is a relatively hard matchup uh, for all of the obvious reasons, but it's yep. not as hard as you would think because of some of the less obvious reasons, like the you know yep. the ability to do the interactions with their fights first. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff you can do there if you know the tricks. Um, and for those watching, I did do a video recently on the to my top five combat tricks, and a lot of that was based around getting around fights first. So there's a bunch of tricks in in that mm. video.
Um, what about Chaos Knights? Now, I know these guys aren't necessarily, you know, that prevalent in the tournament, you know, podium sort of positions, but mm. they are a very powerful faction, and uh, they have a very unique problem, which is that they, they essentially stat check you and just go, cool, I've got nothing but toughness 10, and all of your smaller arms are going to struggle. What's your sort of thoughts into the Chaos Knights? Do you think it's a challenging matchup, and what's your sort of approach? I do not think it's a challenging matchup. Um, I think that they, I think that they struggle into us um, because their profiles um, aren't the best into us, um, and and we can kill war dog profile all day. Um, like I said, though, I think it was, I think I said it here. Uh, the eight bound with plus one to wound, pick up a yep. war dog. Yep. Exalted don't even need help to pick up a war dog. Um, I've had six exalted string out. Um, three of them fought one war dog, two of them fought the other war dog, one sh was string in the middle. I picked up both war dogs. Um, like you can kill so many dogs. Obviously, Angron can pick up two dogs if you let him. Um, and the main list is war dogs, right? The main list yeah. is um, lots of war dogs and nerglings. Um, we've discussed how to you know deal with nerglings a little bit. Um, they're all they're annoying. They're a problem 100%, but you, they can be dealt with. Um, and then the, the Knights player gives us some scoring tools. Um, carnivores do pick up eight bound, like they they are very good at picking up eight bound. Um, but yeah, you what you do is you use the terrain effectively. They can move through walls, but not all of them. Like, yeah. uh, and there's only like so many ways they can move through walls. They still have to be able to fit on the other side. So if you're like one point one in inches away from that wall and huddled inside of a building, they still have to like go around your unit. They can't, even though they can go through walls, they can't go over your unit. Yeah, and so this is another example of where jackals come into play because if you've got yeah, exactly. eight bound on the inside of the wall, further than one inch from the wall, and then jackals behind them, they actually yeah. can't hit your eight bound from the front, and if they go mm -hmm. around, they're hitting jackals. So yep. just another reason why multiple units of jackals is a really powerful tool. Yep, I, I think that it's um, yeah, I think that it's a it's a little bit of an easier matchup. Um, because we can just body them off of objectives, uh, not with OC, obviously. That's OC eight is ridiculous, but um, we just kill them. They'll kill us, but like we can do it a little more reliable. We can kill more of them faster than they can kill us. Yeah. Um, I've had a carnivore not kill three eight bounds. Um, just like you've got five up in bone, you miss a couple, you wound, don't wound a couple. I roll two five ups, and all of a sudden the champion lives. And your war dog has taken six damage, and now Avocado comes and cleans him up, and I've still got an eight bound champion running around doing stuff. Yeah. Um, like, it's it's not, a, or you roll like one six on the feel no pain kind of thing. Like, there's a lot of different ways that we can survive their stuff, and there it's very difficult for them to survive almost anything. Like a three and an army wide three up save um, doesn't lend itself well, even against berserkers. Like, yeah. um, like I berserkers find with the um... My, my advice into the Chaos Knights is take out their carnivores first, because uh, the carnivores yep. can very effectively deal with a lot of our stuff. And once the carnivores are gone, like the blood surge move on that unit of 10 berserkers is really good, because each brigand yeah. is going to kill maybe two or three tops. You know, yep. So each time they fight, they kill three, you blood surge move. Then they kill another three, you blood surge move again. And 100%. you're able to get a lot of, especially if you can get yourself in cover, you know, there's a lot of things you can do to increase the durability of your berserkers. And once those yep. berserkers tag, those brigands, well now the brigands do nothing in melee, and that allows you to run around and do what you want to do with your 8 bound, do what you want to do with Angron, apply that neg one to hit to them if they're going to try to shoot out of the combat that they're in. Much more effective way um, of dealing with them. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, um, I guess the last thing I have is, um, depending on what type of hats they're wearing, um, either stubbers or havoc launchers, um, they'll have indirect, right? If they have havoc launchers, they have indirect, um, your poor poor jackals they'll die um that just is what it is but um what you can do is you can limit the ap on if they have havoc launchers you can limit the ap on their attacks by either putting something behind terrain closer to the brigands than their target now that that unit that's behind terrain is the closest eligible target and they lose their ap buff yeah. um alternatively if it's stubbers you just throw a rhino at them and then They'll probably kill the rhino, um, but it might take two of them uh, because you know they might miss one of the uh, the melters, yeah. The the melter shots, they might not wound with it. Um, they might 
roll a save if I have cover or whatever. Um, so, and, but it, then it stops all those um, strength six bolt cannon things, uh, gallon cannons, from just mulching through eight bound at minus two AP instead of minus one. And then if you can get cover, you're saving on threes. Um, and so you can kind of mitigate their closest eligible target rule in a couple different ways, depending on what little hats they're wearing. Um, obviously, most effectively, if they're they're using the Havoc launchers, you just place a unit of three eight bound way up the field, in a, tucked in a building, safe, hopefully, from carnivores, and uh, all of a sudden, sure, you're getting extra AP versus that one eight bound unit, but it's a zero AP gun, and you're getting cover. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's zero AP, and now they don't get any AP. Um, but yeah, that's in, in terms of Chaos Knights, I think that that's not an overly hard matchup. Um, and then, of course, we get to score bring it down. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, like I think that's uh, fixed is a nice option there. All right, next up, we've got the Imperial Guard. Now, this one, obviously, the, the list we're talking about here is a bunch of indirect, maybe a couple yep. units of Bulgrins, and then a bunch of little trading pieces. Yep. What's your, um, what's very your tough. feeling going into that? Um, so uh, I don't have almost any experience into this. Um, one one game, one limited game, um, and it wasn't all of the pieces that we're talking about here. Yep. On paper, this is a horrifying matchup, especially if you go second. Um, Bulgrin are maybe the toughest thing for us to take out in the game, which is so dumb. But like, they're this just got a weird profile where they like stop the big swings but also they have the feel no pain um i'm sorry minus one damage kind of thing um yeah so like it's just like so many durability rules stacked for so cheap um that they'll probably win most fights with our most of our units just like straight up unless we're like really helping or like get some good dice swings um the bulgren are a real problem for just removing them um Obviously, trading pieces are annoying as well. So if you're, you know, you've got to deal with units of ten infantry, that sucks. Um, if you've got ten horses that move block you and then keep coming back, that sucks. Um, and then obviously, um, your your indirect pieces, your three those three damage ones that they're just gonna like mulch through eight bound units reliably, especially if they've got their like little buffs up. Um, that's a problem because we don't have that many. Like, like my list has eleven units, has four units of eight bound. I'm losing one and a half a turn, kind of thing. That's a problem. Like, that's a big issue, especially now that I've got to cut through all the resources to get to those vehicles. Um, going first, you can do the opposite to them. You can probably pen them in a little bit. Um, what I might even do there is is focus on scouting jackals. And literally just push and then first turn charge like jackals into something that's not going to kill the jackals and string them out really yeah. far and just try to like block them in. I'd be like, here's jackals, kill this, have another unit of jackals set up behind that later. Um, so they either have to indirect the jackals to stop it from happening again, or they get to indirect my damage pieces, which are positions to start hitting away and just try to deny them scoring. Um, yeah. I think one of the things and, that we have to lean on heavily in this matchup is the ability to sticky an objective when you die and the fact that yeah. the jackals will sticky objectives. If you can keep the bulgrim yeah. fighting into your berserkers in your eight bound, you know, you can try yeah. to get Angron in, try to get through, try to eventually get to their tanks, which you will eventually get there. It might yeah. just take you a while. But if you can do all of that, keep them so focused on that, meanwhile your jackals have sticky your home objective, they've moved over onto the objective to, you know, to your left, the safe one, you know, sticky that as well, and then you just keep the action happening in the midboard and to their side, you're going to score a lot of points just by virtue of having, you know, spilt blood on those objectives. So yeah, I think for sure. you have to lean on um, that. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like experience in that matchup, or sorry, more experience in that matchup, but like, um, it seems it seems like a tough one on paper for sure. Um, we have a very good guard player uh, locally, or sorry, a couple of them, um, that I somehow I've just not played at events. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, uh, Barry Bash was either the sisters player or the guard player. Um, and so it was one of those was I was going to be playing on top table and ended up being the sisters player, but I could have been very easily guard at top table there um, yeah. and playing essentially very close to that list, very strong. Yeah. You yeah, know, I think guard are potentially, outside of custodians, are potentially our hardest matchup at the moment. They're definitely one of the challenges. 
Uh, what about uh, Thousand Suns? What are your thoughts on the Thousand Suns? Um, this is another one where I want more um, experience. Uh, so my event experience is limited. I've played a couple practice games against them. Um, they don't seem to want to deal with pressure, which guess who does that? Um, <laughs> we do that very well. Um, and so we can pick up, like their current list seem to be like rubrics, rubrics everywhere with yeah. flamers. Um, Avoid the Overwatch if you can. Obviously, that's easier said than done. Um, and then charge in and pick up rubrics. We have no problem picking up marine bodies. Yeah. Um, and that's not going to be a problem. Magnus, nothing kills Magnus. Yeah, Magnus is a particular um, challenge. Angron can pop him. Um, and a unit yeah, of Berserkers with all of the buffs can pop him. Yeah. But it's challenging. It's, it's Mo, I think it's Mo and 10 Berserkers with all of the sauce. Yeah. And you can, like, get there. Um, Angron, if they re-roll their uh, saves with their nine re-rolls that they have, um, whatever he's doing, with the, every time I roll, he fails a save, he's just like, yeah, I have a re-roll. We're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they've um, got a CP re-roll, they've got a Cabal thing that allows him to re-roll, then they've got a Cabal thing, or it might be a stratagem that allows him to turn one incoming damage to zero. So that's three ways that they can mitigate a failed save. Yeah. So crazy um so yeah basically um it's very tough for us to kill uh magnus but if magnus is the only one left they're not winning the game um yeah so obviously i'm not saying ignore magnus i think that that in in general the advice to ignore something is usually the worst advice um yeah, I agree. If, if you, if it, it like someone's like oh just just fight around it i'm just like that's not a that's not how this game works because they're just going to put that thing in your face and then you have to fight it um or just die um obviously in some cases there's some things that you just like you can't do like if at the end of the game if they have a monolith and i have three eight bound i'm going to ignore the monolith like i'm not going to try to fight um that i'll you know go try to pick up a unit of scarabs and score points that way but um in general i don't, don't value ignoring stuff um so i think that waiting for magnus to come to you um to make sure that you have that reliable charge on him and get your buffs where you need them to be um obviously you want to watch out for the exalted sorcerers on disc and that stupid half movement debuff that they do yeah. um very important to note it that this happens in the movement phase not the shooting phase um so they can't double move and do it to you because the double move ha the double move happens in the shooting phase. Um, but they still can move, you know, 12 inches, maybe plus two for Magnus with an advance and then try to get line of sight because it has to be within 18 inches and they have to have line of sight. So you got to use your terrain and yeah. it's think of it as a shooting attack. Like if you can avoid, like see where he is, where is he able to get to, where can I hide from? Sometimes it's not possible, but especially early in the game, you probably shouldn't be being hit with this ability. Um, and so that way you can get into the position mid-board, um, and then maybe, you know, let's say they go first, they position, you position, they do it to you, but hopefully by then you're in a position to get there, and our auto-6 advance um, will just get around the half-advance move. So while we have half-movement and half-charge, we can just mitigate some of that if we have advance and charge by just going an extra six, getting closer, and then even if we're two away, it's still a four inch charge. If we're four away, it's an eight inch charge. Not great odds. Um, but so you just got to get as close as possible if you're stuck with one of those abilities. Um, yeah. I think one of the things in that matchup is that they're similar to us in that they don't have a lot of units. You know, their units are relatively mm -hmm. expensive as are ours. Uh, so mm -hmm. anytime that you can pull off a trade, it's a high value trade. So I think the advice is generally you need to keep your stuff hidden at all costs because Magnus can one shot um Angron. you know he just with with his shooting and with a, a doom bolt they can just go cool angron's from yep. full health to dead so you have to keep yep. everything hidden but we have the the beautiful advantage of being able to go from this safe you know ruin in our home to pretty much any objective on the board in one turn yeah so you just keep your stuff hidden let them jump out onto objectives respond in kind and never never present yourself as a target to their shooting unless it's a trade that you're happy to make you know come out kill them accept that you're going to die in return 
but make sure you're making those favorable trades. They also have very little reliable combat damage. Most of their damage is going to come from shooting, so you can pretty often use that stratagem to sticky the objective on death. So they come out, they're like, cool, we're going to flame your 8-bound, and you're like, okay, I don't care, because I'm going to sticky that objective anyway, then we're going to tick into my turn, I'm going to score that primary, and now I'm going to send this other unit of 8-bound to go deal with you. So it's a, I think it's a hard matchup. Magnus makes it particularly challenging just on his own, mm -hmm. and the prevalence of the Overwatch is you know a challenge as well if you're playing a, a competent player that doesn't get themselves too close to a ruin or something like that. But it's definitely winnable. Uh, you've just got to make sure that you're not being too greedy and sending out too much at once because anything that comes out is going to die in the subsequent turn. For sure. One of the, the last little tricks is in, in general for Overwatch is sometimes using your 6-inch auto advance not to get as close as possible, but to jump from ruin to ruin. Yes, um, absolutely. To make, to make sure that you're not getting overwatched, maybe you need that's two extra inches, maybe it's like, you know what, I could roll up four and make a three inch charge that's fine or i could auto six need a five inch charge from this other angle and be safe behind terrain and not get that flamer to the face um because you would love to pick up airman squad with no overwatch um yeah. you start behind the terrain end behind the terrain charge them from behind the terrain they can't overwatch you in combat you're gucci um using your tools to make sure that you're avoiding their damage they're obviously their flamers are a big deal yeah. Another real fun one before we get on to the next faction is using your jackals. So if you've got jackals and eight bound behind a ruin, you can move your jackals out and be like, would you like to overwatch? And they're going to say no, because they're holding it for the eight bound. And then you yep. just go, okay, cool. Now I'm going to charge you with those jackals. A unit of rubric marines, they're probably not going to kill a unit of jackals. And now you've tied them up. They're in combat. They're going to have to yep. fall back, which means they're not shooting you, which means you get another turn to push forward. You can do a lot of really interesting stuff with Jackals to avoid the Overwatch. Same with the Rhino. You can just move the Rhino out. And if they're not going to Overwatch you, which they're not going to Overwatch a Rhino, then you can charge yeah. the Rhino into them, tie them up that way. There's a lot of really fun stuff you can do to, to avoid Overwatch. It's a it's a skill in itself. But sure. uh, yeah. I think that's sure. a skill you need to master if you're going to be versing Thousand Suns. Similar story for Death Guard because they have a lot of Flamers as well. Oh, stupid Flamers. Yeah. Uh, let's talk Grey Knights. Now, this one's a really interesting Ooh. matchup because we, we touched on earlier about how reactive moves are one of the most powerful things in the game. And the yep. Grey Knights have the best version of reactive moves, or arguably one of the best versions, being yep. able to take their units and just actually put them back in strategic reserves, which is mm -hmm. really, really painful. They also have some of the best profiles into us. They've got Strikes that have all these fights first. They've got the Dread Knights, really tough to put down. How do you sort of view the World Eaters versus the Grey Knights matchup? That's a tough one. Um, I have two amazing Grey Knights players locally. Um, and somehow, um, one of them's a teammate. And we just haven't played that matchup um, at a high level. Um, but I've seen it played. Um, we've talked about it a ton. Like, we've, like, Discord hammered it to death. Um, and so, like, despite not having no event experience into them um i feel like i can talk about the matchup a little bit at least better than um otherwise um but it's um there's a couple different tricks and tools obviously one of them is the uh essentially brute forcing it is line up 19 charges nine inches away and use angron's plus one to charge and they can't mists Yep. Um, so you're just lining up a bunch of eight inch charges and praying for a couple of them. Um, cause it is a particular problem, especially Drago's unit. Um, be, when he mists, he's just going to wrap it. He could rapid ingress them immediately, right? Like yeah. at the end of your movement phase, they missed in your movement phase, at the end of your movement phase, they wrap it ingress back in. And the next turn he waddles forward and gets a plus three to his, or, or just deep strikes and gets plus three to his charge. Like it, they're yeah. going wherever they want to. You you can't let that unit, or realistically, you don't want any unit to be coming off the board because it just gives them such more flexibility. Lining up a bunch of nines, turning them to eights, and then charging um, sounds horrendous, but it's also like an effective tactic to take away their tactics. We don't shoot, so we're not going to trigger their, trigger their sigil. Um, that's a, 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 sorry, a discussion that I like to have with opponents before the game. Um, 
Like we have a bunch of pistols. Sometimes we're just in the heat of the moment. I'll sh okay, we're in the shooting phase. I'll do my throwaway pistol shots. Like I never want to shoot signal of exigence, sigil of exigence. But if I forget and I shoot Avocado's bolt pistol at that, and then you like gotcha me with that thing, yeah. I'll be so upset. I'll be like, yeah. ah, it's so, that's what feels bad. Like, um, like yeah, obviously that's one of the that with at the very start of the game. You say to your opponent, "Okay, which unit has the sigil? Okay, cool, that unit. I'm declaring now that I will never shoot that unit. So if I say I'm yeah. going to shoot that unit, I'm misspeaking." Because that's not going to happen. Yeah. So you need to correct me. Because like, yeah. I'm um, not shooting it. Yeah, and, and, so, and the same thing for us, right? Like, remind opponents of your blood search. Remind opponents of your yes, of your fights first. 100%. Like, it's like, I've had so many opponents that are like, all right, I'm going to shoot that unit with uh, three heavy bolters. And I was like, you're going to kill two dudes and I'm going to destroy you. So yeah. don't do that. Like, um, you know, it's a game. Like, it, it, enjoy. And that this is one of those very gotcha-y games. Like, Grey Knights versus War Leaders where, like, we have fights first. They have fights first. They have sigil. They have mists. Um, yeah. We have sticky objectives. Like they'll teleport, do this huge play, kill a you know jackals on our home objective, and then we're just like one CP sticky. Get away, get away from me. Yeah. Um, and then once again, another unit, another army with three inch deep strike. Get that forty mil base on those objectives. We've got lots of forty mil bases. Yeah. Um, they just, another good one that you can use in this matchup is the neg one damage is actually surprisingly effective because most of the yeah. grey knights damage output is going to be Dude. two damage. So if you go, cool, I've got this big unit of six Exalted 8 bound, they're on an objective, Drago's unit comes in hot, and it goes for that charge, you just go, cool, I'm putting the neg one damage, I've got my five up, feel no pain, they're going to yep. struggle to chew through you, and then you're going to be able to fight back. And I think a lot of the time, the damage that we do to them is actually done in their turn, instead of in ours. Because yep. whenever we go to charge them, it's very easy for them to just teleport away. Whereas when they charge us, we've got Berserkers fighting first, so we're going to do a decent amount of damage to them there. And then we've also got the half damage on the, the Exalted yep. or, or even on Angron. They charge Angron, you put half damage on it, they're not killing him. And then uh, in return, he's going to pick up a whole bunch of them. So I think that's the way you've got to sort of shift your mentality as World Leaders players. We're often trying to dictate the fights. We're saying, no, I'm picking the fight and I'm going to go fight it. I think this is the one matchup where we have to you know, hand that hat over to them. And be like, cool, you can pick the fights, but I'm going to win them. Um, build, building on what you just said there, um, one of, so like just in discussion, like I said, with a, that Brandon's player that's that's real good. Um, one of the things that I think that I identified or we identified as a really strong play for world leaders is just all up, all up, and move to the middle and own the objectives and beyond them. Um, kind of keep. Uh, at least two good units together almost at all times. Um, and what you can do there is um, heroic intervention. Like, heroic intervention is a huge one, right? Like, they might not have, like you said, they might not always have the damage to get through one unit, let alone two. Yeah. And then you get that other unit fighting. Once they're in combat, they can't miss. Um, you can come over and support with other units. Um, if they are not allowed to deep strike on the objectives because you've got 40 mil bases on those tokens um they're you're gonna maybe they'll score them on primary um and then they have to rely on charges and so usually that's drago or rapid ingress um so spending you know cp or you know using that that thing and if drago charges jackals on some side objective and has to live on an objective now fine with me like yep. stay there um but uh yeah i think that it's, that's a really hard one and there's a few iterations of the great knights list right like if, if you're fighting oops all dread knights that's its own deal um like like they that's a lot of three damage guns that's a lot of um durability realistically um but they can only mist one dread knight so that's where once again with the, like we said with those reactive moves setting up multiple different charges yeah. you know i'm two inches away here with angron i'm three inches away here with six exalted eight pound which one are you misting yeah so, and you can also um, do the you can also go cool i'm gonna let's say you've got angron primed ready to go charge their unit over there you throw these eight bound towards that unit they're like, cool i've moved i've finished a move within nine inches of that dread knight do you want to miss yep. and if they go oh no i'm going to save it because i know angron's going to go into this other dread knight then what you do is you go yep. cool now i'm going to move this rhino somewhere and now they can't yep. miss that yep. original dread knight and then you just go cool angron's going to stay where he is and yep. I'm just it's the exact same him. thing with the, those juicy overwatches right like when yep. when they when you know an opponent really wants to overwatch one specific thing 
you know, or reactive move in this instance to one specific thing, you wait, you do all the other stuff first and you get essentially free moves. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, like that's a hundred percent a valid tactic is to just make sure that you're using your tools correctly, but understanding what your opponent wants to do. Like if you know your opponent wants to do a specific thing, how can you counter that or how to take advantage of that? And yeah. so that's, that's a key. And this is a massive skill is, is getting into the headspace of your opponent, looking at their army and being like, I know that they have the you know, Mist of Demos. They're going to try and teleport away. If I was them, what would I want to use it on? What's the thing that I would be the most scared of? Okay, Angron's there. I would be terrified of Angron. So whichever one Angron's going to go into, that's probably the one they're going to want to mist. So you go, cool, I'm going to do Angron last. And I'm going to move my Exalted Eight Band over here. I'm going to move my Berserkers over here. And you sort of play it that way. All of that being said, I think the Grey Knights is another one of those matchups that's really hard for us because they can true silver yep, armor, so they can get they've all got two up arm saves across the board, and then the true silver means that your berserkers they're going to get two up saves against you pretty much no matter what you do. So yep. that's really hard. Berserkers are not good in that matchup at all. No, the fa and the fact that they can it's, it's low, low, is a problem. Low is good. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's it's a hard matchup for us. Um, Agreed. But yeah. again, like we said with the Thousand Suns, the the Grey, the Grey Knights are very elite. So one of the yep. advantages that we're going to have is that we're probably going to have more bodies than they are, uh, which is yep. going to, that brings some utility in itself. We're probably going to have more units than they are. So you can put out a small unit onto an objective like your regular eight bound. They're going to have to trade an entire Dread Knight to take it. And then if you go, cool, now I'm going to throw my Exalted eight bound. They're either going to use Mist to teleport away, in which case you get that, that you've taken that objective from them, or they're not going to yep. teleport and you're going to be able to hit them with your six Exalted eight bound. And that's obviously not great for them either. So I think we play the trading game better into Grey Knights than we do most things. And we just have to use that to our advantage. For sure. Uh, next, uh, second last one. So we've got Tau. Now Tau, obviously they've just got a new codex. So most people haven't got much experience into it. So, mm. um, but, you know, we're weaving in some experience and knowledge for previous Tau because they weren't massive changes there was some pretty interesting yeah. ones but you know it's not like it became an entirely new faction uh what's your yep. thoughts on the tau world leaders matchup so correct me if i'm wrong they still don't have a fallback and shoot i do not like i don't they, think i don't believe so i don't think um everyone's talking about montcaz and his spiciness um obviously we've got i've got some really good players in my chats um and they're they're you know they're very hot on montcaz because of its ability to essentially alpha and be reliable damage so early in the game but once again if with no falls back and shoot and essentially seven leadership on most of their yeah, stuff the, the exalted that's eight real juicy for, that's real juicy for those exalted eight bound um because they still have no melee either so like we're talking about maybe some crew but crew are gonna come on come on nah. so <laughs> um, so um so yeah like like touching stuff with exalted or near exalted because once again that that's a six inch aura you can absolutely have exalted not in combat behind a building within six inches of the enemy unit and you could have jackals into them and they have to pay to fall back it's yeah. not from the exalted it's within six inches of the exalted and that's a big deal that sometimes people don't clue in on yeah. is that like you can actually string a couple things in and if one and if you get like a big scary unit that lives because the opponent can't fall back from it you get to kill that in their turn that's huge right and then, you, then you're running free um there's well, i i really like the new crisis suit change like i think it's really cool um there is some they don't have reroll to hit on uh, the sun forges like the eradicators do which is really good because i was looking at that rule originally thinking oh no i know Another, another overwatch thing that angron was like oh like yeah like you don't want to like eradicators just re-rolling all their hits in overwatch is actually pretty scary especially when they re-roll their wounds and all the damage sun forges are essentially the same rule without the re-roll hits which means their overwatch just isn't as good um yeah. and without sustained one from kalyan they're not you know it might get one through um yeah. the flamers are obviously a big deal but their strength four ap zero in retaliation cadre they'll be a little better so strength five ap1 maybe ap2 um but uh you can once again it's i think it's the um they get extra ap against the closest enemy unit no it's it's extra ap against um non-vehicle or monsters yeah uh, the, 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 so 
against your infantry, they'll essentially always be AP one or two. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, something like we said we can get, you can get around with you know clever movement or getting something in first and then charging from behind a wall kind of thing. Um, there's ways to get around Overwatch. I don't anything that gives bring it down up that judiciously. I I think we have a strong game into um, because we can kill vehicles. Like we have a strat that says we can kill your vehicle. <laughs> like we're legally allowed to. <laughs> we can murder it. Um, and so. Um, I'm very interested to see the points. It'll be interesting to see how the new codex shakes out. If they remain all the same points, then Riptides are going to be very, very strong for like 165 points of their durability. It's bananas. Yeah. Um, but I do think that we have a strong game to Tau. I think that we have a strong game to Tau now. Um, once again, because of the ability, just they can't fall back. Like they can't fall back and shoot. So um, even if just touching them works, like just touching them works, and then. Um, let alone preventing them from falling back. So, um, yeah, I'm not overly worried about Tau. That said, there's a good player for every faction, and that player can beat you. Um, yeah. I'm firmly a believer that player skill trumps everything. Um, there's a list out there that will dumpster me for sure on Death Guard and Tau and whatever else, right? Like, I can lose to anybody at any time. Um, yeah, I often a, find... A so, so, I've got... um. Because uh, I'm captain for Team Australia this year, so I play a lot into Australia's finest players. Um, awesome. And as I'm playing into them, I'm just losing over and over again. I'm losing into Thousand Suns, I'm losing into Death Guard, I'm losing into Chaos Knights, I'm losing into all this sort of yep. stuff. And I start, my faith in the world leader starts to falter. But then I go to a tournament, and I'm just winning, 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 winning. And I'm like, ah, oh, I'm losing because those guys are crazy good. That's the problem. Yeah. It's not the fact. And and as a result, every time I lose into them, I get a little bit closer to the win. I, I'm a strong yep. believer in I want to lose every practice game because you learn more from losing than you do from winning. Sometimes yep. when you win a I game, do. you actually, you know, you do the opposite of learning something. You win because you got lucky and then you get false yep. confidence. And then when you go into a tournament, you don't get lucky. You end up losing a game and yep. you're like, how did that happen? I thought I'd win that matchup. So... I like losing my practice games. I find that you, you know, it's a lot better for you know your your development as a player. And uh, absolutely, I hundred percent agree with what you're saying there about how there's you know every faction is going to have that one person on it that they know the world leaders match up as good or better than you do. They know their faction really really well and they know exactly what they need to do. But yep. you know, not every player is that. So I think a lot of this general mm -hmm. advice is going to help people when they're yeah, competing sure. against people of that sort of same that same caliber. Uh, I, I think other... it's, yeah. What you said. Oh, sorry, you go. Yeah, I think what you said is super important. Um, is is losing is totally fine. <laughs> like it's totally fine to lose games. Like oh yeah, uh, it happens to literally all of us. Um, you know, it's it's in, like you said. Sometimes it's important to do. Um, and one of the things with world leaders, especially us um, diehard veterans of the world leaders who only play world leaders or play a lot of world leaders, know that our experience and our skill is well earned. Um, there have been so many times where I first turn charged with six units and lost them all because I did it in a poor way or charged yeah. poor targets or overexposed and then got my army shot to hell and then I had nothing left. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of different squares. Uh, skills to learn in a melee only army it is a hundred percent playing warhammer on hard mode um you have to learn the fight phase which is most complicated you have to open yourself up to interrupts um heroic interventions all the other stuff shooting doesn't worry about any of that you poke your little gun out from around a corner and roll all your dice and the opponent dies or they don't yeah. with melee you have to do all of that but also advance also charge also base models in the correct way also do all this other stuff like you're 100 percent having so many more skills to learn and world leaders players who are new and they lose games get they get discouraged and they're like oh i'm really bad at this or i'm not good or um i'm i'm like you know world leaders is just a trash faction uh no nah, man like it's they're really really strong like i'm really happy with where they are but I do think they're they're one of the highest, if not the highest, skilled factions in the game. You can 100% win games by unga bumping into other you know newer players or players who don't understand the matchup. But once you get to that mid or top table area, like people kind of know how to play the game, and melee only faction has some 
serious drawbacks. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually so, quite reflective in our win rate at the moment because the World Eaters win rate yeah. is, is quite low, yet yeah. we keep winning tournaments with them. It's like the podium, the, our, our representation on the podium and at the bottom is both really, really high and there's not a lot in the middle. You know, I think yeah. there's a lot of people that they pick up the World Eaters, they're new at it, they don't know what they're doing and as a result, they get put in the dirt really, really hard. But then you also get those masters out there that go and go, oh, well, I'm actually just going to, you know, maybe it's a six round event and I go five and one or, you know, even yep. four and two at a six round event. It's like, that's respectable. That's a good win rate, you know. Yep. But yeah, I think you, uh, you're absolutely right. And I think that one of the other things about the world leaders, and granted, like you, I'm a world leaders fanatic. I play exclusively world leaders these days. Um, but I do find that the world leaders community is one of the most welcoming and one of the most uh, creative and positive. We get a lot, there's so much activity happening in the various communities that we, we have where you'll learn the tricks that you need. You've just got to be persistent. You've just got to stay with it. Don't get discouraged too soon when, when things don't go your way because there's people out there proving, like yourself, proving that it can go your way. If, if, yeah, for sure. if the stars align, we can do amazing things. Um, yep. That's probably a good place to segue into what your thoughts are about an upcoming balanced data slate. So we've got points costs coming out soon, updated points yeah. costs. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the, the updates? Do you think there's any units that really need love? Do you think there's any units that could afford a nerf and not be that big of a um, deal? What are your thoughts? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the, um, so we'd like, 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 um, so we, like I said, we did the red path tier list yesterday. And so like, um, I think there's a, quite a few units that need love. Um, yeah. I think Terminators, Hellbrutes, Helldrakes, Defilers, um, like all of them could be really fun in World Eaters. Um, they're melee centric or close combat centric and just not where they need to be. Um, whether it's points or a data sheet rule, like the Terminators could use a data sheet rule overhaul immediately. Like that's like one of the worst, if not the worst Terminator rule yeah. in the game like everyone else gets minus one to wound or like reroll all hits and we're like plus one to hit if you lost some guys like yeah. come on um but um, not to mention we've got no characters to attach to them so everybody else gets to dial their terminator bricks up even higher and now it's just sort of yeah blur. for sure that that's that's a hundred percent a piece of it right so um but yeah i think that uh that you know terminators could use a little bit of love i think one of the common common um, things is people say berserkers could use some love. I don't disagree. Like I think that they're expensive for for marine bodies, but like I've had so much success killing whatever they touch. Like yeah. like for the most part, like excluding like like you said, AOC two up saves. That's the that's the that's the bar for berserkers and what they don't kill. Um, but like they kill a lot of stuff for a hundred points. They're OC10. They move incredibly quick with our rules. It, it's very, it's a slippery slope. Like if they went down ten points, um, like how fast would I transition to maybe twenty berserkers and yeah. do an extra, and, and instead of like a mo brick with glaive, and then a Karn with glaive, and then a Karn brick. With yeah, 10. well, I mean, it's and one of those things. The berserkers are a really good example of this faction because I feel like when you look at them side by side against any other marine unit. You're like the world. The berserkers are too expensive. You look at them side by side, and you're like, but they are cheaper, and they get, you know, this or that or whatever. Yeah. Yet still, the list that I run has two units of ten. So it's like yeah. I'm simultaneously I'm thinking this unit's too expensive and it needs to go down, but I'm spending one, you know, four hundred points worth of my army is this unit. Yep. So it's clearly not that yep. bad. A lot of Otherwise, I wouldn't take so many of them. Almost everybody takes at least one unit of ten. So I think the unit is actually fine. The biggest challenge I have is that being only AP1 and in a world where Armor of Contempt exists across multiple factions, that's the biggest Achilles heel of the Berserkers. So it feels bad for sure. If there was something that allowed them, maybe a stratagem or a, a unit that gave them an ability to ignore modifiers, including Armor of Contempt, something like that would be really cool. Or if there was a way to get them up to AP2, that'd be really cool. 
Yeah, I think AP2 cool. is dangerous. That's a slippery slope. Like, maybe maybe those, something those... where sixes to wound or an additional AP. It's exactly, right? Like there's, Something there's, like that where it just um... makes it so that Armor of Contempt isn't an absolute deal breaker. Yeah. But I think, I think realistically I think that... the way to use Berserk is just to just accept that limitation, accept that they're not good into yeah, those targets, something... and fight other things. Fight, you know, if you if you if, if you worry they're going to armor of contempt on something, charge two things at once, and then they can only yeah. armor of contempt one of them, and then just kill the other yeah. one, right? So you, there's sure. ways around it that I think if we ask for additional AP or points cost reductions, then all of a sudden they're going to become OP, and then mm -hmm. it's it actually creates a, a problem on the other end. So I agree. Yeah. Well, I, look no further than the last edition, right? Like no further than the last edition, AOC existed. And berserkers were like minus two to minus four AP depending, yeah. and you're just like killing literally all the stuff with random yeah. dudes with rage issues. Um, yeah. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with a unit, especially a troop unit, having a reasonable limitation. Like these things kill star gods, dude. Like what are you watching from them? Like <laughs> exactly. Like, like, Look, like, what do you want them to do? So yeah. I think that they're very good. I think that they, like if we could easily see like a five point drop or a ten point drop, and I think that we might because they're like the face of the the faction, yeah. um, and we're an underperforming faction currently. Yeah. Um, like our win rate according to stat check is forty six percent. Yeah. So like, it, it's it's we're down there. Um, but. I think that like it's it's very dangerous um, to give some of these units buffs. In terms of flipping the page to units that could see nerfs and survive it, I honestly am unsure that there are any. I think yeah. that there's a lot of units that like we're taking that are just like already so pricey. Like Angron's not worth 415 points. Like he's, no. he's he's not. Like if you take away the revive and you show that data data sheet next to any other monster Primark centerpiece yeah you're like this guy has no special rules he gets to reroll hits which like all of them like a lot of them do yeah. um and, and then that's it no lethals no devs no like you can activate lethals sorry but like like nothing that like makes him stand out um now i will say that it, like his data sheet damage is maybe the best in the game like other than magnus yeah. like like nine ap strength 16 ap4 d6 plus two is wild um, but like no s realistic way to get around like four up in bones. Like he yeah. he goes into like a Terminator break and kills three dudes. Yeah, like, and I find that with his damage output, yes, it's insanely high, but it's actually yeah. at a point of redundancy. It's so high. Like if he charges into a unit of Terminators and Magnus charges into a unit of Terminators, they're both probably gonna kill two to three, right? So even though Angron's damage capacity is way higher, unless you're versing literal yeah. titans, like it's overkill almost all the time. So, yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I don't think he's. I don't think he can tolerate going up. I also think one of the problems with Angron is he is a must-have in the army for more than mm -hmm. just his data sheet. You know, yep. the ability to put reroll hits. He's the realistically he's the only thing that gives it in the faction yep. other outside of Khan, of course. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you go into something that's neg one to hit and you have no access to rerolls, all of a sudden your dedicated melee units are doing no damage. So I think if they nerf him, it actually just takes the entire... Fa he's the, kind of the linchpin of the faction. So even though he's a must-have, I don't think he can tolerate a nerf. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, because, yeah, he. I, mean, I, think we're, I think we joked about this on uh, the tier list yesterday, is if he doesn't revive... He's nowhere worth nowhere near 450 points. Uh, when you think when you look at like the Nightburner at 255 and like yeah. the Avatar at like 350 or whatever it yeah. is, and then like Monolith is 350 or something like that. Like all of this stuff is cheaper than him and has like crazy rules. But if you get him back even one time and you divide 415 by two, yeah, he's now undercosted. Like yeah. and so like it's a it, that it, that mechanic is really weird. Um, but I don't think he can tolerate a nerf. I don't think our eight bound can really tolerate a nerf. They're already sitting at like fifty points a model for yeah. three wounds that have a three up save. Yeah. Like yes, they move fast. Yes, they hit hard. But if they get hit, you're losing fifty points a model, and you can they and people pick up eight bound easy. Like it's not hard. Um, yeah. So like, there's a ton of like we're very expensive because our rules are so amazing. Like I, I maintain that like our data sheet might be, or sorry, our detachment might be one of the strongest in the game. 
from like a pure rules perspective. Like look at like they've already had to nerf our enhancements. Like they're still takeable. Yeah. Like our we have four amazing strats, one situationally strong strat, and one strat that you forget about. Yeah. And then our like our um yeah, like our, our even our data sheet rule, like plus one strength, plus one attack on the profiles that we have for our faction synergy wise is insanely powerful. Yeah. Turning Berserkers and 8-Bound from Strength 5 to Strength 6, real good. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, two 8-Bound eight eight have seven, uh, three 8-Bound have 14 attacks. Like, that's a lot. And they're all, and they're pretty much all hitting you because they reroll wounds and can reroll hits with an 8-Bound nearby. Like, we're over, we're too expensive, but our rules are insanely strong. And so, like, it, we're on this wire where too heavy-handed on the points and it just feels super bad and we just lose because we can't fit enough stuff too low on the points and our stuff becomes way too way too um efficient at the points cost yeah I so agree. um i don't i honestly don't foresee any points raises um because of where we are in the in the stats i also don't want to see too many points drops because that'll just lead to nerfs yeah. um I think, to, I, think, I think if we get left alone a few of the big scary things get nerfed and everything yeah. else more or less stays the same. Maybe a few of the bottom tier factions get some slight buffs. I think the world is in a really good spot. I don't think we yep. need to change I, I think we're in a great spot. I yeah. think if, that we're if, in a great I, spot if I could press a button right now that said they will definitely not change world leaders, I would press it. I would rather risk yeah. no buffs as long as it locked in, no nerfs, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's probably a pretty good place to wrap it up. We covered off a lot awesome. of ground there. Uh, thanks yep. heaps for your time. Um, I'd love to have Absolutely. you on again some awesome. stage when maybe when we get sure. the data slayed out and we got some new points costs, we can sort of unpack that. Or if you, if you have any any results at an upcoming tournaments or anything like that, you'd like to chat about because uh, yeah, sure. I think we covered some great ground there. It was really interesting. So uh, thanks for your time. Uh, is there anything you want 100%. to plug before before we wrap up? Any any upcoming projects that you're working on? Anything like that um, before, we, before we close off? Yep. Um, so that's, yeah, not too much personal stuff to plug, uh, but uh, but an upcoming tournament, Can Hammer. Uh, so it's a big team tournament in Canada, uh, eight-man teams, so very WCTC style. Um, I'm uh, captaining our team GTA 40K, which is going to be really fun. Um, we're really looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, obviously, like you said, we did, did the... Um, the wrap up tournament wrap up with uh dara the red path which was really fun and then we did a tier list um i love being, being on the stream with uh, all the different content creators you guys are awesome and do so much for the community so i'm really grateful to be on um but yeah thanks so much man it was a it was a blast it was fun to talk and uh i'm sure there'll be more to talk about in the future fantastic all right thanks mate and uh for everyone that's tuning in um thanks for tuning in like subscribe all that good shit and uh we'll talk to you in the next one cheers Today's video is brought to you by Proxy Wars. Head over to their website if you want to show some support to those who support this channel. Walk for the blood gun.